Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming back to the second half of the 2014 Southwest Division Contest. Before I proceed any further, on the off chance, if you happen to take a little quick break, fired up one of these babies, please check one last time. Smile at your neighbor, wink at them if you like, but show them how you turn it off. That would be out of respect for both the contestants and the audience members. Now, before we proceed, there is a brief announcement, and I would like to call Tim Bolger to the front, our videographer, to share that announcement with each of us. Okay. Tim? All right. Just a brief reminder that these contests are being videotaped for pronouncement to the web. Links will be made available after the contest to your division governor so your contestants can, can view it right away. They will all be made public after the last division contest. If you want to see the division contest and the last previous four years of speech contests, you can access them at my website, which is www.timsvideo.com. Contest. Yeah. <laughs> Again, there is a disclaimer, so I'm going to zip through that disclaimer really fast. Once the contest has begun, the sergeant in arms will secure the doors. I see Steve already you know, pounding with his fist, with just in case you ask him. <laughs> Members of the audience are asked to refrain from leaving or entering the room during any of the contestants' presentations. You may do so after or in between presentations or after all of the ballots have been collected. Now I will announce the speaking order of the Humor Speech Contest. Contestant number one, Michael Lowe. Contestant number one, Michael Lowe. Contestant number two, Janice Fountain. Janice Fountain. Contestant number two. Contestant number three. Christine Moriarty. Christine Moriarty. Contestant number four. Garrett Gray. Garrett Gray. Contestant number four. Contestant number five, Leah Hackett. Leah Hackett, contestant number five. Now, there will be one minute of silence before the first contestant and between each contestant. Primers, when I advise you to do so, please signal me with the green light when one minute is up. And after all the contestants have spoken, the judges will be given all the time they need to complete their ballot. Speech contestant number one, Michael Lowe, driving range distractions. Driving range distractions, Michael Lowe. Mark Twain once said that golf is a good walk, spoiled. <laughs> Fellow Toastmasters, Distinguished guests, 
dignitaries. Golf is hard. <laughs> it's difficult. It combines the simple hitting a stationary ball with the ridiculous hitting it with a weed whacker. Oh my gosh. And that's why they invented driving ranges. How many people here have been to a driving range? Driving ranges are kind of like batting cages, but they're for golfers. And the golfers stand in a partition that's open. That's about the width of a bathroom stall. And they hit <laughs> into a field that looks vaguely like a abandoned graveyard. <laughs> <laughs> the goal of going to a driving range, of course, is to improve the golf swing. Unfortunately, there are a number of distractions that get in the way of that goal. The first distraction are the golfers who bring their young families to the driving range. So, as I quietly prepare to hit my ball when this, these people are at the range, I suddenly hear, Daddy, I'm hungry! Daddy, I'm tired! Daddy, this game's stupid! <laughs> and then, oh, I bump into a toddler. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Situations like that make me want to go over to that golfer and give him a, a babysitter's phone number. <laughs> because little children have no business being in a driving range. The second distraction are the golfers who decide to bring their girlfriends in for a golf lesson. The reason for these air points is because it's less of a golf lesson and more of an excuse for those golfers to make physical contact with their <laughs> girlfriends. And for whatever reason, they position themselves next to my partition. And I don't know, is it because I make them look good? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, these golfers, are, some of them are pretty good golfers, and they have some pretty good advice. So I'm tempted to look over there. And I feel a bit like the people Tom. <laughs> worse than that, if I'm caught, it's almost as though I'm photobombing a love story. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> anyway, fortunately, driving ranges are pretty big, and I can go to another partition somewhere far away from the young families and the lovebirds and concentrate on the golf swing. The golf swing is easy to explain, but really difficult to execute. It starts by first gripping the club correctly and then addressing the ball. Hello, ball! No, no, no. <laughs> but actually positioning myself. The whole action is driven basically by the wrists. And the way I learned it, I don't have to swing that hard. It has to be graceful and a finesse kind of motion. In fact, I shouldn't even be thinking too much about it when I swing the club. The best way, at least for me, to not think about it is to think about the swing the same way I think about an old girlfriend. I think about her in a very vague sense, but not too specific to get mired in the details. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, there are plenty of other golfers out there who learn how to play golf in a different way. And worse than that, there are golfers who got no instruction at all. And that leads me to my third distraction. <clears throat> and these are the newbies, the newcomers. And these golfers come in usually swarms of five or six guys. They seem to be refugees from a party that gone bad because they keep the entire driving range of them with their party zone. And there's usually one guy who's supposedly the expert, and he's teaching him how to swing the club. The other guys in the group, they decide to try it. A lot of them have varying degrees of success because many of them have been drinking. And if I'm nearby, I gotta take cover because those balls are flying everywhere. Oh my gosh. The fourth distraction are the golfers I call the power swingers. Because they are swinging the club as fast as they possibly can. It's like they're in their own martial arts movie because you hear the wind whipping. <laughs> and the experts say that, you know, you really shouldn't be swinging the club that fast because I wouldn't be, or no, nobody else would be able make contact. However, these guys are making contact every single time and are heading into the next galaxy. <laughs> the caveman part of my brain wants to match that because nothing says macho more than the sound of metal hitting plastic. <laughs> <laughs> when I do it, oh my gosh, 
I end up looking like a demented windmill. <laughs> and I lose track of whatever I'm trying to do. Holy cow. The fifth distraction are the golfers. I call the twisters. Because it seems like we're swinging to some melody that only they can hear. <laughs> and horse checkers say, no, 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 you shouldn't move your body around because it prevents your club from making contact with the ball. However, I, I totally, totally envy these guys because they have something that I lack, which is lack of inhibition. I lack, I have too many inhibitions. I can't make a really good follow through. So when I try to do that, and do what they do, which is be a lot more looser and dance, I end up slicing the ball in every other direction. The other golfers will look at me like, hey, who brought this newbie in? <laughs> As you can see from all the distractions I've mentioned to you today, it's easy to understand why my neighbor built a driving range in his garage. <laughs> <laughs> However, I think he's missing the point. How many people here have seen the movie Caddyshack? Yeah. I know the movie exaggerates just a little bit, but it kind of shows you the kind of people that show up at a golf course. And you do find the people who are the power hitters, the dancers, and even the swarms of newbies. Which is why <laughs> the driving range is a great way to practice filtering out those kinds of distractions. Driving range distractions and the ability to filter them out are an important part of the game of golf, which is why I will continue to go to a driving range to practice my swing. Thank you very much. Humorous speech contestant number two, Janice Fountain. My date with Superman. My date with Superman, Janice Fountain. Two blocks down on your left, and you can get more information there. 
So we meandered over to the Chamber of Commerce, which in itself is a tourist paradise. <laughs> Tons of photo opportunities located in this, because it is Superman. Those things where you can stick your, your face through the hole and your body can look like Superman or could, can look like Lois Lane. You mm -hmm. get what photo opportunity you, look, you like. We walked up to Lady and said, do you have to know anything about the Superman run? She goes, here's an entry blank and the phone number at the bottom. Call that, you'll find out. So Paul is on his phone. I said, find out if there's t-shirts left. Find out if there's t-shirts left. What time is it? Where is it? Where do we register? <coughs> find out anything you can. Are there showers? We found out that it was located at the state park. So we drove over there. Showers were unlocked. So we changed, walked over. Filled out our entry blank. I did the four mile run and Paul did the two mile walk. Put our name into the possible door prize pot and just kind of enjoy the camaraderie of the people. This is a small town, it only has 6,500 people. And tonight they were honoring the local firefighters who had their outfits on and their helmets and a local war veteran. As I said, this is a small town, so it kind of had that small time feel about it. Everyone knew everybody else, so he goes to my church, he attends my school. It was just really nice, but <coughs> Superman Festival. So, there is someone representing Superman. Josh, who's a personal trainer from Texas, morphs his body into the icon. Mm -hmm. Muscles bulging. Puts on his uniform, the cape, even styles his hair with a little curl. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, I was excited, too, because growing up as a child, we used to race home so we could turn on the little black and white television, and they say, is it a bird? Is it a plane? No, it's Superman! It was such a hump. <laughs> I did not get, you know, real excited when I saw him. It wasn't like the kids went, Mom, Mom, there's Superman, there's Superman, hi, Superman. And he walked around. It was just really, really a nice evening. Seven o'clock was approaching, so we walked down to the start of the race. Announcements were being made. What announcement being? that if a thunderstorm roars through here, do not, I repeat, do not go under the gazebo. Turn to the lady next to me, why can't we go under the gazebo? About four years ago, thunderstorms rolled through, everybody went under the gazebo, kaboom, the whole gazebo rope caved in. <laughs> Nobody was hurt, but it was a pretty exciting race. People definitely remember that one. <laughs> the national anthem was sung, and bang! A cannon started this race. I thought that someone had placed the AED pads on my chest as I drove to start. It was an awesome evening. There were no bugs, no mosquitoes. Metropolis is located in southern Illinois, right along the Ohio River. Small run, small town, but it was just beautiful. And we ran right past Joe's Grocery Store, which in front of Joe's Grocery Store is Joe's statue. Another huge statue. In fact, I think it looked even a little bit bigger than the 15-foot Superman statue. <laughs> this town really likes the statues. So we continue running. We're entering the end of the race. Not only did I get a water bottle at the end, but I got a hand towel with the official Superman emblem on it. Wonderful. Paul had already finished his walk. We meandered over to see what the post-race festivities were. I've been to a lot of races. Beer, tacos, pizza, ice cream, peanut butter, banana sandwiches. But this had the first time ever homemade cookies. That was to die for. So after I had more than my fill of homemade cookies, we looked over to see what the prize raffle table had. My name was on one of them. I got a Hallmark Superman coffee mug. <laughs> we decided we should probably, we had a little ways to go yet. Don't get changed. Got changed, we're walking back, and the announcements are being read for the awards for the different age groups. I said, Paul, well, is there a possibility in this day to see if I happen to win anything? Do you ever win, Janice? Well, it kind of depends how many people are in my age group. My age group was approaching. So they announced females age 60 to 64, third place, Janice Fountain. Yay! So I go flying down there. I get my plaque and I get a picture taken with Superman in his arm around me. So, ladies and gentlemen, for a mere $20 in Metropolis, the second weekend in June, you can get, yes, a Superman shirt. <laughs> you can get an official hand towel with the Superman emblem on. And if there's only three in your age group, <laughs> And your name gets drawn, you can get a 
Superman mug, but the most priceless thing I have in this bay is a picture of me with Superman's arm around me for my date with Superman. <laughs> <laughs> Timers, may I have one minute on the clock for the judges to complete the balance? Speech contestant number three, Christine Moriarty. How to survive a bathroom terrorist? <laughs> How to survive a bathroom terrorist, Christine Moriarty.
program that clockwise <laughs> I bless this room with love and light. I bless this room. <laughs>
Speech contestant number five, Leah Hackett. Exotic adventure. Exotic adventure, <laughs> Leah Hackett.
walk into a restaurant. Unbelievable! There are benches all around the restaurant. We had to sit and wait. Sit and wait. <laughs> another 30 minutes. Finally, we sat down. <sighs> now I can relax. Got myself some tea. This is a Japanese sushi restaurant. The sushi chef is in the middle, prepare the sushi. It's a huge round table. Everybody's sitting around the table, and the sushi is coming around in front of everybody. So you can pick and choose whatever you like to eat. As I was sitting there, sipping my tea, relaxing, having a conversation with my girlfriend. These two gentlemen walked in and sat right next to us. The minute they sat down, they start grabbing the food left and right, left and right, <laughs> and start stuffing themselves with sushi. They ate so much, they look like chipmunks. <laughs>
Mr. Contest Master, we have all the ballots. Excellent. Yes. Okay. Very good. 
And Garrett, I'm just going to tell you right up front, I had to drink water for your title. You're the only person that I had to actually get my, wet, my whistle wet so that I could do that. Uh, and Garrett will only be coming up, this time I will not have him come up when we interview humorous speech, so I'm just going to compile it all. Um, let's see here. I, I've met your lovely wife before, so I would like for you to share with us, because I know who she is, yes, I see you, I know who you are. So I would love for you to share the story of how you met her, because you two are just about the cutest couple that I've seen at every time. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. I met my lovely wife, Mandy. Raise your hand, Mandy, so everybody can see this. <laughs> a beautiful wife. At the kind of a circumstance that would be frowned upon. At one of my best friend's parties, she's his sister. <laughs> and uh, so when we started dating, uh, I, I met Mandy at this party. And I remember thinking before I met her that, oh, I got to go to dance party. You know, I can't stay long. Then I met her, and I couldn't stay long enough. <laughs> You've got to tell me how you came up with your humorous speech title, because that was just probably the coolest title I've heard. For those of you that didn't catch it the first time, it was Garrett and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Monday. Well, it's a riff on a children's book that's now becoming a movie with Steve Carell. Right. Uh. And I went through so many permutations for titles, and that had it in, well, not, it wasn't brief, but it had it in all the, uh, the words you use. So that's, that's the skinny of it. Okay, very good. And the last thing I'll ask of you, you have a very interesting quote, and I'm, I'm noticing that nobody's attributing the quote to the person that said it. So maybe this is all like, you know, a conspiracy that you want to do it up here, but your quote is, what one man can do, another can do. Yes, and that quote's from a movie uh, called, um, now I'm blanking here, Little Help Mandy? The Edge. The Edge, yes. With <laughs> Anthony Hopkins and Alec Baldwin. And my movie tastes aren't as, as good as Keisha's. Where's Keisha the Chief? Oh, I'm sorry. No, no I, her favorite movie it pales in comparison. Mine pales in comparison to hers. I, my favorite movie is Be This and Butthead Do America. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm down here. You know, you know. Um, but she, The Edge is a story about man against nature. And Anthony Hopkins and Al Baldwin are chased down by this bear, played by Barbara Bear. And at one point, it's do or die. And Anthony Hopkins tells Al Baldwin, who's the bigger and stronger, but yet not as mentally strong. And he tells him, what one man can do, another can do. And he tells a story about uh, Indian natives that the little boys, as a rite of passage, would slap the bear on the, on the face before they gutted it with poles. And so I, I know that sounds spoiler alert. <laughs> You know, part of the bear's an actor. No animals were harmed, Stan, sorry. <laughs> but, but what it shows is that, you know, if these little young children can do it, these men can do it as well. Don't despair. If you do competitions or anything like it's all about the repetition. repetitions. The more you do, the better you get at doing that something. The more confident you get at doing that something. So compete. Always do something. Get those reps in in life, whatever they are. Because what one man can do, another can do. Thank you so much. I'm doing well. Good I'm doing wonderful. Well, for the audience, please share with us what club, well, first and foremost, how long have you been with Toastmasters? I've been with Toastmasters about eight months. Eight months. And what club are you representing tonight? I'm representing Peace Toastmasters. I've given three speeches in the comedy community. Okay. Very good. Very good. Paul, I've met you a few times at Peace. In fact, I think I just saw you a couple months ago. But I'm very fascinated. So you've given three speeches. You've been with the club less than eight months. And you've already assumed the role of treasure. Can you take on a leadership role? Tell me how you overcame any fear, or was there any fear for you to walk into a leadership position and speak so new to the organization? There wasn't really that much in the way of fear with it. We're very the, the whole club is very supportive, and we all and we all work uh, work together very much. And I, I've been getting a lot of help from the outgoing treasurer, and I and I knew I was going to. It's very much sort. It's very much almost like a family where you where you you know tend to lean on each other, and 
everyone works to help each other out. Very good. And I also want to applaud you. You said you recently graduated from UIC? Uh, UIUC. UIUC, which stands for? University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Okay, so, so non circle yeah. campus, the other one got it with a BS in chemistry. <laughs> that is pretty cool. <laughs> Affinity for science, and now you have a degree. So, what is next for you in your professional career? Well, I actually just got a uh, new job at a company called Intertech, which is doing uh, quality assurance uh, work. All right, very cool, very cool. I like how you say this. So, I, I read quotes. That's always usually where I go. But instead of that, for you, so what inspires you the most? Seeing the way the world fits together. This is something that I find when most individuals have that approach. It's something that starts at a young age. So I'm going to assume that that's what happened to you. And if that's the case, tell us when you first recognized how you had this passion for putting the pieces of the puzzle of life together. Well, the first time actually was in preschool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I realize half this audience can't even remember high school. <laughs> <laughs> I was fascinated by the fact that some things would stick to the magnet and some things wouldn't. And I asked the teacher why, and he said, well, it's because it's metal. I'm like, but my corner's metal, it's not sticking to it. She's like, well, it's because it's got you know, things that have ironed it. I'm like, oh, okay, why? <laughs> <laughs> and I've been asking that question ever since. <laughs> well, thank you so much for continuing this. Day. swing a club in the first place because he taught me how to do it the right way and that makes all the difference from all the characters that I see at the driving range <laughs> <laughs> because if you do it the right way consistently it's almost three-quarters of the battle. Uh -huh. Very good, okay. You have a very, uh, you are one of the rare ones so first and foremost I'm just thanking you right now. You actually listed who gave this quote so we're good with that. <laughs> but here is your quote. Damn my circumstances, I make my opportunities. Yes. Don't say that. Anybody know who that was? Rough guess. Michael, share with them who it is and why this inspires you. It was, it was Bruce Lee who said that. We were not. <laughs> and uh, it's inspiring because whenever I think about things that are insurmountable, but there's no way that I can succeed at something, he's someone you can think about and say, well, look at this guy. He came to this country in the 60s. And he had limited language skills at best. And somehow he managed to become a martial arts icon. Yet somehow it kind of puts the pressure on you. <laughs> and so I try to make it inspired. 
Tell us who told you that quote or where you heard it and how that has impacted your life. Um, actually, when we were in camp, I was camp counselor for eons, we would sing that song. I won't bore you with my singing, but that always, I can sing that song in my head over and over and it gives me, gives me strength when I'm already full off, so yes. Will you do it for me? Will you sing just that? <laughs> just that? <laughs> no. No. Be not afraid. For I am with you always, come, hold my hand, and I will lead you home. Of course, it was acapella, so. Thank you. <laughs> Even though I'm Irish. So <laughs> <laughs> there is a little bit of 
Catholic. You know, there are therapists out there. Issues which I'm working on. <laughs> yeah, kind of you should take uh, you know, Meg to that place yeah. as well. Maybe they can help her out. You say what inspires you most is beauty, but beauty is so subjective. How do you define that element of beauty that you know resonates with you? You know, it's it's ever around us every single day, but a lot of times we don't look. I'm a photographer, so. <laughs> I'm kind of trained to look for beauty. Sometimes you see it, like right now, your face is beautiful. It just shines with love. Now you walk on the spot, you walk in here, it's a beautiful day. Um, yeah, yeah, for me it's beautiful. <laughs> it's everywhere. Cool. Christine, before I let you go, because you said it, you have to sing us two lines. The song that is going through your head right now.
and our contestants, you have the courage to come up here and speak in front of people you don't know. I mean, that, that takes something. That takes a guy. Many welcome back. So at this time, and hopefully I haven't forgotten anybody, and if I have, thank you. <laughs> at this time, I'd like to announce the winners of the contest. So. Donna, if you would join me, and Melissa, you would join me.